Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Yu Feng Luo. I'm a first year master's student in philosophy, uh, in philosophy at the University of Tartu. Uh, I feel honored to be presenting at the conference today. Uh, today, my presentation is about memory studies, and the title is uh, Competitive or Multidirectional Memory Representing the Estonian History of Double Occupations in Wobomo Museum. Uh, there will be three parts of it. Uh, the conceptual analysis, the case study, and the uh, theoretical uh, reflection. Uh, so first, conceptual analysis. Uh, so as you can infer from the title, uh, one crucial concept for my presentation is multidirectional memory. Uh, this is a term coined by the American scholar uh, Michael Rosberg. Uh, and it becomes a very important reference point in memory studies uh, since uh, he published his book, Multidirectional Memory, in 2009. Um, memory is a very uh, important concept. Different from history or the past, memory refers to certain uh, perception and understanding of particular events. Uh, it can be individual or collective, and memory always has a profound impact on society and politics. Uh, so since memory is even about the same event, uh, they, uh, they, they, can, uh, they are not necessarily uniformed for uh, different subjects. Uh, therefore, uh, memory can be com competitive with each other. Uh, for example, the collapse of the Soviet Union some people may think it is a moment of liberty, but some people may think it is a fall of a great empire. This depends on uh, their different background and experience. Besides, memory can be competitive because individuals and communities have their own priorities. Uh, thinking about the World War II, uh, for Jewish people, of course, it is the Holocaust uh, in Europe that should be uh, under the spotlight, uh, while the uh, massacres that happen in Asia maybe uh, does not take that much attention from them. Uh, so uh, Rosberg, he summarizes that it is uh, very common that the public sphere in which collective memories are articulated as a scarce resource and the interaction of different uh, collective memories within the public sphere takes the form of a zero, uh, zero uh, sum struggle for attention. So, uh, in face of the reality that memories can be competitive or they try to push each other out of the public sphere, Rosberg uh, proposes his theory of multidirectional memory. So, uh, for him, memories do not necessarily be competitive with each other. On the contrary, they can be uh, multidirectional and productive to each other. Different memories and different narratives can provide a cross reference and have a dialogue with each other. And this is definitely helpful to uh, solve the historical conflicts between uh, different communities. Uh, Rosberg discussed some examples in his book. Uh, for example, the learning about French World War II history can help people to understand the Al Algerian people's suffering during the Algerian War of Independence in the 1950s and 1960s. So uh, if uh, we can establish a connection between these two memories, then it will help the reconciliation between the French community and the Algerian community. Uh, however, I would like to point out that there are some inherent restrictions of this uh, theory of multidirectional memory, and I will identify them in the case of post-communist Estonia. Uh, here I argue that actually in the whole region of uh, post-communist Central and Eastern Europe, there is a lot of practice of multidirectional memory. Uh, you can find those practices in literature or political discourses uh, published by the political actors. However, 
I would like to take memorials and monuments as an example. Uh, for example, in Tallinn, there are two uh, famous memorials. One is the Brown Soldier, and the other is Victims of uh, Communism Memorial. The first one was unveiled in 1947, uh, and the second one was established in 2018. So uh, putting aside all the controver controversies uh, caused by the Brown Soldier, uh, it can be um, acknowledged that uh, it is a sign of commemoration of the Red Army, Army soldiers who fought against the Nazi Germany in World War II, while the second one is dedicated to the Estonian victims uh, during the uh, Soviet occupation period. So this, when these two uh, memorials, they coexist in the same city space, and there is apparently a tension in the narratives that they try to represent, uh, such as the, the image of the Russian soldiers. Uh, Russian soldiers. Uh, so uh, when this happens, you can see there is a cross reference between them, and hence there is a dialogue between them. And this is a great example of how uh, multi-directional memory can happen uh, in reality. Uh, Another case that I'd like to pay more attention to is the Wobomu Museum of op 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 uh, Occupations and Freedom in Tallinn. So, the Wobomu Museum is never a national museum. It has been uh, closely connected to the Estonian political establishment uh, since it was opened in 2003. Uh, and there is a very noteworthy section in that museum, and it's named Soviet Estonia. So in that section, the history of the double occupations, namely the Nazi and Soviet Union occupations of Estonia are put together and compared explicitly. Uh, so on this, uh, on this slide, you can see there is a picture. I took it from a reading machine. Um, in, in that section of the museum. So on that, uh, this reading machine presents the texts and images uh, regarding the two regimes on the different sides of the, on the same screen. So in this way, it's very uh, effective for, uh, to establish the connection between the two histories and to uh, promote the idea that uh, the Soviet occupation deserves the same attention as the Nazi Germany's occupation. Uh, as scholars observed, by deliberately using uh, iconographic elements from both Holocaust and Gulag memories, uh, it encourages emphasis for the human suffering experience under uh, both regimes. So we can imagine that when visitors say information on the reading machine, like uh, for example, on the uh, left side, uh, it, it is estimated that nearly 80,000 uh, people were sent to neighbor camps or deported uh, from Estonia during Stalin's reign of terror. About one third of them died far from home. And on the uh, right side, a total of approximately 14,000 civilians died in the territory of Estonia during the German occupation. When they say the information together, uh, they are very easy to develop the belief that uh, actually the communism is even uh, the greater evil compared with Nazi Germany. So uh, from the above examples, what I uh, try to say is like there is indeed multidirectional mnemonic practice in the uh, representation of the double occupations in post-communist Estonia. And the purpose of such practice can be uh, interpreted as giving people the understanding the same essence of uh, the Nazi and Soviet regimes. However, I contend that maybe such uh, practice is not uh, as successful as we may think. Uh, so here I, uh, I present some facts that can characterize the failure. So first, uh, there is actually no global recognition of the same evil of the two regimes. Uh, 
we actually we, we don't even need to think of this uh, issue on a global level, but just focus on the level of the European Union. There is a lot of evidence. Uh, so, for example, in 2009, uh, the European Parliament adopted a resolution on uh, European conscience and totalitarianism, which is the furthest reaching official expression of a totalitarian interpretation of communism to date. Uh, however, this adoption is unfinished due to its inconclusive external outcomes uh, outside European Parliament. For, for instance, there is no legal development regarding the criminalizing uh, communism or its history denial, while there is certain uh, certainly the legal uh, like regulations regarding the Holocaust denial. Uh, besides, we can compare uh, a two memory, memorial days. So the 23rd of August is the day of remembrance for the victims of all totalitarian and authoritarian regimes in the EU, while the uh, the, uh, the the twenty seventh of January is a memorial day for uh, all the European Holocaust victims. So, uh, in fact, the the, mem the memorial day for the victims of Holocaust has gained much more uh, like recognition uh, within European Union, while the other one uh, is still quite unknown to many citizens living in other EU countries. Um, and third, although the platform of European memory and conscience was created, uh, it never received operational support from European commissions and its lobbying has been unsuccessful. Uh, and second, uh, the memory of the Soviet occupation still has to compete with the Holocaust memory to earn more attention from people. As Schooner said, uh, narratives of Nazi occupation are often used to frame an anti-communist uh, interpretation of history that even depicts communism as the greater evil. And I think the uh, exam the case we discussed of uh, Wobbleman Museum is a uh, can confirm this. Um, and third, the multi-directional mnemonic practice does not really contribute to the regional peacemaking. So let's think of the advantages that Rosberg assumes when he proposed the theory of multidirectional memory. He said memories can be productive and contribute to each other. It will promote dialogues, conversations, and help to reduce the conflicts and help reconciliation. However, for example, these things do not happen between Estonia and post-Soviet Russia. Actually, the practice of multidirectional memory uh, increases the tension between these two uh, political actors. Then, uh, at this point, we have to rethink of the concept uh, because the case study shows us the difference between the theoretical design and the reality. So we have to ask, uh, is there something that we have ignored? Uh, I argue that we can identify three uh, prominent restrictions on the concept. The first one is, although the multidirectional memory practice tries to establish connection between uh, the two memories, like uh, the Holocaust and, and uh, or the Nazi Germany occupation, and the Soviet regime, but the, the Holocaust memory always has super, uh, superiority over the Soviet Union crimes memory. Uh, and this is a particular historical experience that uh, isn't covered by the theoretical design. Uh, so what are the, for example, what can be the particular historical experiences? Uh, for example, uh, the anti-Semitism and fascism did in, uh, occur across Europe in the 20th century, while the murderous experience regarding Soviet Union uh, occupation was not shared by uh, the Western Europe. And second, there is a acknowledgement of Russian contribution during World War II that makes it difficult for 
uh, the Western Europeans to uh, acknowledge the concept such as red totalitarianism. Um, so this is the first point. And the second one is uh, there is an unbalanced power relations between the Western and Eastern Europe. Uh, so, the Estonian scholar Maria Makoso once argues that by all its different uh, des designations, Eastern Europe has traditionally been uh, positioned within geographical Europe, but simultaneously put in the loop of being less European than its Western counterpart, and therefore destined to unceasingly attempt to close the gap of full Europeanness. So the various strategies uh, Estonia employs in the memory battle uh, to some degree reflects this long-term problem. So on the one hand, the traditional less Europeanness is one motivation for Estonia to seek uh, Western support and recognition of its uh, certain historical memory. On the other hand, this long-term problem is also the reason why uh, this practice of integrating the Soviet crimes into a pan-European memory is unsuccessful. Uh, the third point about the restriction of multidirectional memory is that uh, there is actually unpredictability regarding how political actors employ uh, this methodology and what will be the outcome. So uh, in certain situations, multidirectional memory can promote peace uh, without that, but in the case of Estonia, uh, Estonia is still in face of the threat from present Russia and the recognition of certain historical events. Uh, it's directly uh, related to the current uh, geopolitical conflict, and thereby it becomes an issue of uh, mnemonical security instead of just a cultural representation. So. Uh, therefore, uh, for the actors like Estonia, uh, multidirectional memory for now is not used as a tool to make peace, but used as a weapon to defend itself from the uh, ongoing threat. And this is the reason why the normative ambition of peacemaking does not happen. So uh, in the end, uh, we have to ask what is the right attitude that uh, we, we are supposed to hold towards this concept of multidirectional memory. Does the case study uh, prove that this is actually a useless theory? Uh, I conclude that first, this idea of multidirectional memory can be very helpful, uh, but it's perhaps too ideal to be real, realistic in many cases. Uh, and second, as Rosberg explained five years after his book uh, was published, he uh, admitted that there are three dimensions of this concept, uh, descriptive, normative, and analytic. Uh, so first, descriptive means uh, it describes the objective potential of memories to be multidirectional uh, and productive. And normative means uh, it is able to help solve the conflicts and promote peace. And analytic means uh, this concept can be a methodological tool for the academic, uh, academic research of memory uh, studies. But in fact, only the descriptive and analytic dimensions are always in, in effect. And uh, whether the normative dimension can be fulfilled uh, really depends on a lot of variables. Uh, such as the particular historical experiences and the power relations, uh, as is demonstrated before. Uh, and in the end, returning to the case study, uh, it, it can be concluded that the representation of the Estonian history of double occupations in Wabombo Museum uh, demands more exploration in order to make the memory uh, truly multidirectional and uh, productive. Uh, so that's all uh, of my presentation, and thanks for your listening. <laughs> Thank you for the presentation and for being perfectly in time. And uh, now we have time for questions. 
Comments? Yes, Alejandra, please. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. So I was curious, uh, maybe it's outside the scope of your research, but it still would be interesting to hear your take on this. So how do you think current events in Ukraine might change your theoretical framework and, and the kind of arguments you are putting forward? For example, about Holocaust and oh, yeah. that kind of actually European attitude towards... Yeah, I think actually it can maybe help the dialogue, actually, because I think yesterday I just read a, a news report on uh, the website of CNN. So it says like a Jewish guy living in Warsaw decides to uh, like host a Ukrainian family because he thinks uh, this reminds him of his memory of, uh, you know, the Holocaust in the 20th century like what his ancestors have uh, suffered. And you can say in this case, there is a connection between the Holocaust memory and what's happening in Ukrainian uh, in Ukraine now. So um, I think this event uh, shows us the potential uh, of uh, establishing the connection between different memories and how they can uh, be uh, productive or yeah, so yeah, I think that's definitely a good, you can say it's a material, but also it's ongoing. So, yeah. Thanks very much. I think probably there are going to be different shifts on if you distinguish between this normative level and analytical one. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Ilo, please. Yeah, thank you for this uh, insightful discussion. I have two questions. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is about the application of this concept of multidirectional mm -hmm. memory. You, you spoke more about, well, shared social realities and representations. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could apply this concept also to individual memory. Mm -hmm. does, it, does it make sense, for example, doing research on oral histories on just working with one informant can individual memory be multidirectional? And the, the so, second question is it's different. It is, well, you brought these insightful, insightful examples from Estonia, which is a small, small country. Yeah. If you think about China, mm. could you give some examples from China about multidirectional memories? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I think both of the questions are very interesting. So about the first one, whether individual memories can be uh, multidirectional, I think the answer is yes, because there uh, I have uh, read a lot of uh, re research papers, uh, like a lot of scholars, they try to explore this topic. Uh, I remember there is a term named uh, prosestic memory. So prosestic means something, you know, that does not belong to you first, but it's like a, like a prosthetic leg. So uh, the scholar believes that if uh, with the help of technology, like we are or something, so we can even share different individual memories and therefore we can develop empathy for uh, other people more. So I think this is uh, possible and it's uh, uh, there is a lot of uh, discussion about it. And the second one, in the case of, of China, uh, I think I can give you a very interesting example, but maybe it's not, uh, it's not like a successful example of multidirectional memory, but more it's about how we fail to establish such connection. So uh, as I talked about before, uh, during the World War II, there was a Holocaust of Jewish people. But at the same time in China, there was the massacre of Chinese people uh, which was committed by the Japanese army. Uh, so uh, in China, we have a very famous memorial museum. It's about Nanjing massacre. So about 300,000 uh, citizens uh, were killed during that massacre. But if you, uh, because I, I never been to that museum in person, but I have uh, seen the official website and on the website, you can actually say all the exhibitions, uh, you know, just online. So I noticed that there was a section, uh, the name is like uh, foreigners living in Nanjing at that time. So it mentioned a lot of help that uh, the expats gave to local citizens during that period. And very uh, surprisingly, you know, uh, there were a lot of like German uh, people were uh, were mentioned. So 
a very interesting thing is like in the Chinese Memorial Museum about the massacre, we, they didn't even mention any crime that Nazi Germany has uh, committed in Europe. And the only place where Germans showed up was in that section. And uh, they mentioned all the help like the German people give to local Chinese. So, uh, you know, you, you can say like, I don't know if we can say this is a sign of the knocking of uh, dialogue, right? Because if we have such dialogue, maybe they should uh, also acknowledge like what they should also acknowledge and mention what uh, the Nazi Germany has done in Europe, but they didn't. And the only uh, thing about the Germany was quite positive in the Chinese Massacre Memorial Museum. So I think this is a very interesting case for me. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, maybe then I can ask a question. Um, it's uh, maybe related to, to the term you've just mentioned. Um, I was thinking when, when we were comparing um, and talking about the memories of uh, communist regime occupation and Nazi occupation um, in terms of a memory, I think uh, it is also interesting to acknowledge that uh, when it comes to the memories of Nazi regimes, uh, for many people it's mostly um, quite distant now. Yeah. Maybe this is prosthetic memory that you have mentioned, that it's, yeah. it's not really their first-hand experience with the occupation, but the experience of their parents or grandparents or great-grandparents. Yeah. Whereas uh, for the Soviet occupation, there are still a lot of people who experienced it first-hand. Mm. Uh, so do you think this also um, has an impact on how this um, multi-directional memory is represented because the time frame is different? Ah, uh, you mean like the because they happen in different times? Yes, yeah, and because also the, nowadays uh, a lot of people uh, like they they know about Nazi occupation only through some media or through some books yeah. or through some family stories, whereas uh, for Soviet occupation they still remember it from yeah. their lives. Yeah, uh, that's true, and I think that's that's what like a lot of memory institutions, you know, like archives and museums try to uh, solve this problem, like to make people, how how to make visitors feel empathy for some distant events. Uh, I, I also remember, you know, in uh, Obama Museum, there was a section, like when you, uh, there was a, like a special room. So when you sit there, uh, there is a big screen and it will show you the, like the videos of Siberia. Mm -hmm. And also you can hear the sound, like the wind and everything. And the temperature, I think, was a little bit lower than other rooms. So you could really feel like how uh, those Estonian people felt uh, when they were deported to Siberia. So I think for me, like uh, for you, like uh, maybe like Soviet uh, occupation memory is more related and the Nazi Germany memoria is more distant. But for me, both of them are distant. Mm -hmm. And But through that experience, like that room made me feel more related to people who were deported to Siberia because of the the strategy they used. So I think, uh, I guess there can be a lot of interesting, uh, you know, experiments regarding uh, this thing, like how to make people develop Emphasis for the events that they haven't experienced or they didn't really uh, feel related before. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 